Hi, this is Mr. Adams from Midwood High School, and this is a video on solubility curves in reference to uh, Table G. Um, when you bring solubility, solubility curves, um, we have to take into consideration what type of compound we're dealing with. So we must know whether the compound is ionic or covalent. Um, we must also look at the amount of solvent in terms of water that we're using. Um, typically on the graph itself, on the y-axis, we're using 100 grams or 100 mLs because the um, density of water is 1 gram per 1 mL. So you can see either 100 mLs or 100 grams in terms of um, uh, the, the actual solvent for water, grams or mLs could be used. But if they use 200 mLs or 200 grams, you have to take that into consideration and you have to multiply by 2. If they use 300 grams or 300 mLs, you have to multiply by 3. If they use 50 mLs, you have to divide by 2 and so on. So always take into consideration and watch out for how much water solvent the problem is giving in comparison to what's on table on your ref table G on the y-axis. Okay, um, we've done the fact that um, in terms of gases, right, they behave a little differently than um, liquid or solid solutes. They tend to decrease in solubility, okay, as the in temperature increases, okay. Um, when pressure is released, okay, we notice in the soda, think of a soda can, the pressure is released, okay, the gas escapes, so solubility decreases. So when you decrease pressure, okay, solubility also decreases, okay? And likewise, if you increase temperature, right, you're giving the particles um, higher average kinetic energy, and your solubility will also go down, okay? So decrease pressure and increased temperature is sort of bad for solubility of gases. Okay, moving on. Um, before we get into actual um, some actual problems, we must remember the definitions of saturated, unsaturated, and supersaturated. As we agreed in class, saturated simply means that the solution is filled to its maximum with solute. So, anywhere on the line, any point on the line, okay, would represent a saturated solution. Okay, it's filled to its max with solutes. Now, if we have a saturated solution, guys, and we add more solute to it, that solute will simply fall to the bottom, okay? It would not dissolve. And a saturated solution has a unique uh, feature about it. It's actually in equilibrium, meaning that there's something equal. There's equal rates of dissolving of solid going into solution, and at the same time, at an equal rate, their solution turning back into solid is invisible to the eye, but it happens and it's dynamic, meaning moving is back and forth. So at, at saturation point, you have equilibrium taking place. Um, anywhere below the line, okay, anywhere below the line would represent a unsaturated solution, meaning that it can simply dissolve more solute. So when you add more, when you add solute to a unsaturated solution, it will simply dissolve, okay, until it reaches saturation. And the other guy that we need to know is supersaturated. So anywhere above the line itself, okay, above the line is supersaturated. And in order to get something to be supersaturated, we agreed in class that you must, must, must heat, okay, heat a saturated solution, okay, in order to get it to be supersaturated, okay. Another feature about um, a supersaturated solution is that if you add a crystal to it, you'll get this sort of kind of um, cool effect right here of rapid crystallization. Okay, so what's going to happen if you add um, a crystal to a supersaturated solution? You will get rapid crystallization. But if you add a crystal to a saturated solution, it will just simply fall to the bottom. Okay. Um, we have problems here as before, so what you're going to do, you'll pause the video and do number one, number two, number three, and number four, and we'll see how we do. Okay, for number one, they're simply asking at what temperature do saturated solutions of sodium chloride, or they gave us the name, they didn't give us the actual formula, so we have to know our, memorize our um, names and formulas, and potassium chloride, okay, contain the same mass all right, of solute per 100 ml of water. So once again, they said 100 ml of water. We're dealing with 100 grams of water, but since the density has a one-to-one -one ratio, we're, we're not going to panic. Yeah, we're not going to panic. We're just going to simply um, know that one gram is per one ml. 
All right, so what we have to do, we have to simply find sodium chloride first, all right? So we find sodium chloride, it's over here, NaCl, we move along the line, right? Now what the question is asking about is asking about the same mass. So we're expecting that the sodium chloride line and the potassium chloride line will intersect at some point if they have the same mass. So the potassium chloride line is here. So as we go, we'll go in this direction, we're moving in this direction, you'll see that the intersection takes place about here, right? Okay, so this point around here is our intersection point, and that's approximately going to be around uh, 37 to 38 degrees C. Okay, now if they have a question like that, they sometimes give you a nice little range that you can use, you know, like uh, two or three degrees. So don't panic, that's our answer, and you're done, we move on. Okay, next question is number two. Uh, saturated solution of potassium nitrate is prepared at 60 degrees C using 200 ml of water. If the solution is cooled to 30 degrees, how many grams will precipitate out? Now, once again, folks, if you have a, um, a saturated solution and you cool it, what's going to happen? Um, you would have recrystallization, okay? Solid will form, or that's our precipitate. So what's going to happen is we we'll must, first of all, find potassium nitrate. Potassium nitrate is KNO3, and this is our KNO3 right here. So we must identify that and keep an eye on it, because we have a whole bunch of lines all over the place. So we must make sure we have the correct, um, correct chemical. All right, so we find 60 degrees, all right? And then we go up to the line. So we go find 60 degrees, and we go up, 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 and we hit the line, okay? And at that point, we go across, okay, as carefully as possible, and we hit the y-axis, and that point right there is approximately 105, 106. So let's say it's 105. So that's 105 grams at, okay, 60 degrees, all right, and 100 mLs or 100 grams of water. But notice that the question is asking about 200 mLs of water, right? So since it's 200 mLs of water, we must double our solid value. And 105 times 2 is 210 grams. That'll, that will be also at 60 degrees, but this will be at 200 mLs. Okay, now we move on to the next part. Um, we're cooling it to 30 degrees, so we find 30 degrees, okay, and we go up, up, up to our our potassium nitrate line, which is right here, okay, so we hit it there, hit it there and we move across there, okay, so our potassium nitrate line across there is around, let me see, around 45-ish, 46-ish, okay, maybe a little more, okay, let's say, let's say for argument's sake, it's 46, all right, so we have 46 grams at, okay, 30 degrees, okay, and that's at 100 mLs or 100 grams, right, but since the question said 200 mLs, we multiply that 46 by 2, Okay, if I'm not mistaken, that will give us around 92 grams at 30 degrees for 200 mLs. All right, so what you do next, you have these two values for 200 mLs. You have 210 grams, you have 92 grams. Okay, you do a simple subtraction. So you, if you can do it on your head, no problem, you get a calculator, you plug it in. Okay, you do a simple subtraction of 210 and 92, and that should be 118 grams difference, and you're done, and you move on. Okay, how many more grams of ammonia? All right, ammonia is a, 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 a important gas using industry and using ammonium products, ammonia, um, different things, and the formula is NH3 using cleaning products and stuff. And it's straight into gas, all right? Can be dissolved in 100 m mLs of water at 10 degrees, then 90 degrees C. So once again, what's happening here, we are increasing the temperature, right? But as we increase the temperature, what's going to happen is we see that the solubility will decrease for gas. So first and foremost, we have to identify ammonia. Ammonia is right here. It's on this line, NH3. Okay, at 10 degrees, we go up to the line. 
all right? We hit the line, we go across, we read across, okay? So at 10 degrees, we see there's 70 grams of ammonia. So we have at 10 degrees C, okay? All right? We have 70 grams of ammonia, all right? Now we move, look at the next um, temperature in question. We have 90 degrees, right? So we find 90 degrees, we find 90 degrees, we go up, 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 bam, we hit it. We move across, okay? On across, 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 and we hit 10. So at, sev at 90 degrees, okay, we only have 10 grams of ammonia soluble, all right? So the, the solubility is decreasing. And what we simply do with these two values, the 70 and the 10, we do a simple subtraction to get the difference, and we see that 60 grams. So 60 grams of ammonia, okay, more of ammonia could be dissolved at 10 degrees than at 90 degrees. So we see that the effect of temperature on solubility of gases in terms of it decreasing the solubility of gas. And we move on. Okay, the last one. A saturated solution of sodium nitrate. Okay, sodium nitrate, sodium is Na, and nitrate, H or I, look on table E, and that's NO3, so that's NaNO3, right? So we can identify that right there, right away, okay, NaNO3. And 100 mLs, okay, at 40 degrees, is heated to 50 degrees. Now, they say the rate of increase in solubility in grams per degree is what? Now, it sounds like a weird question, but all, this, all they're asking is about rate, how many grams are dissolved per degree? That's all they're asking, folks. So what you do, you find your sodium nitrate line, which we just did. You find 40 degrees, okay, and you go up, up, up to that line, all right? 40 degrees and go up to the line, and you go across, all right? And you hit that line right there on the y-axis, and that looks about 105 grams at 40 degrees C, all right? Then you find 50 degrees, so let's use a different color. 50 degrees, and you go up to the line for sodium nitrate. So I'm going up, 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 and I hit the line right there. Okay, and I'm going to go across, all right, and that's about 115, right? So we have 115 grams at 50 degrees C. Okay, so what's our difference, guys, in grams? With 105 and 115, that looks like it's just going to be 10 grams, right? And our difference in temperature looks like it's going to be 10 degrees C, right? So if they're looking for grams per degree C, you simply do a division. You have your 10 grams divided by 10 degrees C, and that's 1 gram per degree C, and you're done. That's your answer. And we're done. Okay, folks, as always, hard work plus sacrifice equals success. Um, pay attention to the information I gave on the front of the slide. Okay, you know if the compound's ionic or covalent. All right, that's very important. Um, look at the amount of water in question on your chart. On table G, it's, it's going to be 100 mLs or 100 grams, but they can give you any variation of that, any multiple of that, or any, you know, and just go from there. Um, know that relationship comes from the fact that water has a one-to-one -one ratio in terms of grams and mLs. Know how gases behave with pressure and temperature. Okay, you need to know your definitions in terms of saturated, unsaturated, and supersaturated. Okay, um, hope you guys got something out of this video, and I'll see you guys soon. Take care.